Please note, this podcast series features graphic descriptions of forensic pathology techniques, violent crimes, accidents and traumatic incidents that some listeners may find distressing or upsetting. All kinds of animals can kill people, from leeches, roosters and sheep, to fish, monkeys and camels. In this episode, Roger details the many bizarre ways people have been killed by animals and how animals can help solve a mysterious death, but also complicate a criminal investigation. From the advertiser, True Crime Australia and the University of Adelaide, this is Guardians of the Dead a podcast exploring the ground where death and science meet. I'm Greg Barilla. Hi, I'm Elisa Black, and I'm here today with Roger Bayard, forensic pathologist extraordinaire. We're discussing something a little bit different today. So, Roger, tell me about the rooster. I think the importance about the rooster case is it shows you that it doesn't have to be a bull tearing down at you a pamplona to uh, cause a problem. And this was just um, an elderly lady who had very bad varicose veins and uh, roosters, I understand, are quite nasty animals. And this rooster went for her and just pecked her. And a couple of pecks through a varicose vein and uh, she bled to death. How, how quickly did that happen? It can happen. You can put out a fair amount of blood from um, varicose veins if they get a tear in them. It can look like an arterial spurt, in fact, because they're actually sort of big and dilated and full of a lot of blood. But uh, I was telling a colleague about it, and uh, she said she'd had one with a cat that had just scratched its owner. So the point about that is, okay, it's a weird way that an animal has killed somebody, but what it really focuses on is how vulnerable elderly people are who have varicose veins. And we could use that story to then tell people, if you've got varicose veins, be very careful around sharp objects, animals, and what happens is if you get a tear, call somebody, but put a bandage around it and lie down and put it up in the air. So that story got a lot of interest around the world. And I had a journalist from New York phone me saying, thanks so much, my grandmother's got really bad varicose veins, now I know what to do. So I think the purpose of that is that even something that appears odd and weird and quirky can actually have really important messages. So how did you work out that the rooster was the one who'd done it? The scene was very um, compelling. Basically, she'd been at the chook house. She'd dropped the eggs she'd collected. The rooster had hightailed it out and there was a trail of blood around the yard to where she had collapsed. And at autopsy, I could see peck marks. So, you know, it's a pretty cut and dried case, which is, I think, why the rooster had left. So if death by rooster is pretty rare, what animals do you see causing the most problems? Oh, I think it comes down to dogs, um, because there are so many dogs around, and there are a lot of vicious dogs. And it depends on the community, too. Uh, I mean, I have friends in Romania... And the street dogs there are basically, uh, they're just vicious. And um, they killed a Japanese tourist a few years ago, just nailed him in the street. Um, so we're lucky here we don't have that problem. But you know, any uh, dog has the potential to actually uh, cause injury because they're, they're animals and they've got a powerful bite. Um, I, you know, I think golden retrievers are perfectly safe because I like golden retrievers. But if you look at uh, staffies and pit bulls, um, they're animals that have been bred for a certain purpose. And if you look at the, the statistics on, on um, uh, what breeds are the most dangerous, they, they come up pretty high. Again, it's a problem, you know, how do you know an animal's this breed? You know, what if it's a, a mongrel? You don't know. The most vulnerable ones in the community, of course, are kids. I think 70% of the attacks are on kids. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that kids tease dogs. And the second is that they're small and vulnerable. And dogs can really make a mess of children. They, they, they have two sort of ways of attacking. They can go for the head and the neck, and they can crush skulls. They can damage um, vessels in the neck. And what they do is they've got this sort of um, hole and pinch movement, and they shake. And that can cause tremendous uh, injuries. Or else, if they're in a pack, sometimes they'll chase and they'll, they'll grab the buttocks, and they'll 
bring the victim down like that. And when there's a few of them, they do tend to get a, a pack mentality. So if you're dealing with a death by a dog or a pack of dogs, do you try to find the the injury that caused death or is it just a matter of putting everything together and saying one of these was the, the fatal bite? No, you've got, to, you've got to work out exactly what happened um, because it, it may be very significant in a medical legal context. Uh, there was a case I was involved with overseas where a little boy had been chased by two dogs and really badly hurt. Um, and the police actually had to use submachine guns to get the dogs off this kid. And he, he was conscious when they got to him. Um, they euthanized the dogs. And you do necropsies on the dogs as well. number of reasons. You want to see if they're, if they're scarred, if they've been involved in dog fights. Do they have drugs on board? You know, is it part of this dog fight thing? Um, do they have um, pal or processed food in their stomach so they're a domestic animal? Do they have you know, wild food? Um, the other thing is getting DNA from the victim on the dog and that sort of thing. But looking at the stomach contents in this case with this little boy was really important. One dog had pieces of the boy in his stomach, the other one didn't. So the owner of that dog was convicted, I think, of manslaughter and it was a lesser charge for the other, the other owner. Wow. Do you ever see cases that are that intense here? Oh, we see, yeah, we see uh, dog attacks um, and none of them are very pleasant. Um, and you see, you, know, you read about them interstate as well. So they're, they're right, right through the country. They're not all that common. Um, I mean, it's interesting how animals can kill you. I mean, if you look at the, the dogs, that's a sharp force attack. Um, blunt force, horses, uh, donkeys. I've had a case of a donkey who attacked a fellow. Um, water buffalo, they're big animals. They can crush you up against the wall. They can stomp on you. Um, Elephants. Uh, a colleague and I had a woman who was killed by an elephant in New Zealand. Um, young male elephants get really aggressive and sat on her. Um, so each animal species is capable of doing this. Um, and then you get into rarer and more strange deaths. Um, stingray deaths. And we know the, the naturalist who dived down over the uh, stingray and the, uh, the barb came up. Australian crocodile hunter Steve Irwin has died during a diving expedition near Port Douglas Queen's in Australia. Adventurer Steve Irwin, who won fans around the world for his love of dangerous animals, has been killed in a freak accident. He was killed after being stabbed by a stingray barb in the chest while filming an underwater... I was always told when I was a kid in Tasmania snorkeling, do not irritate the stingrays because that's what they do. There have been cases where people have... Um, been fishing and they put a, a fish bait in their mouth and you know turned around and joked and inhaled it and and blocked their airways and from africa there have been cases where people have actually drunk water from a lake that's got leeches in it and the leeches lodged in the uh, the upper airway and as it's engorged itself it's it's blocked off the airway so i mean uh, do animals have like you've spoken about the dogs obviously and they have teeth that are designed for a certain way of eating or killing when you got, if you had said a body arrive and it had a certain injury, would that suggest an animal? Like do animals, you've spoken about horses having that that blunt force trauma. Yes. If you found a body in a paddock and there was a sheep and a donkey and a horse and a cow, would you be able to work out which animal did it? Well, the dog wouldn't have the hoof marks, so we can eliminate him if there are hoof marks. Um, and the horse wouldn't cause the the bite marks that the dog would. There was a very infamous case um, in North America where a mother, I think, was convicted of stabbing her daughter to death because there were these paired wounds around the base of the neck. And of course, that was a dog. That's where dogs go. They'll bite your neck. So when I see uh, an injury that I think is a dog bite, there'll be these, it's focused on the face, the neck and the head. Um, you may get scratch marks uh, as well, where the dog sort of pawed at the body. So there are various things. And then you can do the DNA comparisons and you may find dog DNA on the person. Um, but then the crush injuries, like the water buffalo. Um, how can a water buffalo kill you? Well, as I say, it can push you up against the wall of a, um, a shed. It can stomp you or it can gore you with its horns. So there are three mechanisms there. And we can tell, you know, if you've got a, a puncture wound through vessels, obviously from the horns. Um, if you've been crushed, your face is very red. You get these little particular hemorrhages. So there are signs at autopsy that can tell us the mechanism. You mentioned before that camels have a particularly... Uh distinct way of Camels attacking. are really nasty animals. It's incredible. I know they've got gorgeous eyes, but um, they, uh, 
if you get onto um, the internet, you can see videos of, of camels because they've got a very long neck and they can come at you from all sorts of angles. They, they will pick people up and shake them and throw them. Um, so they, they're quite bad tempered. And then they, of course, can stamp you and, uh, and also sit on you as well. You see a lot of stories coming out of the US as well. Obviously, they're allowed to own more exotic animals like chimpanzees and tigers and things like that. Do you have any experience of those kinds of Chimpanzees, pairings? again, actually, probably the top of the list of nasty animals would be chimps. They are um, – I worked with some colleagues in India, and um, these were actually macaques, not chimps, but they were um, – they steal babies. So they, they come into people's houses because they're often open, you know, on the upstairs patio – and they'll take babies and drop them off uh, walls and things. Chimps, on the other hand, chimps will actually hunt human babies for food. Um, there have been some awful stories in uh, Africa of women having their babies in their um, shawls and the chimps just grabbing them off to a tree and then just dismembering the child. And when chimps attack, they, you know, there are stories that we've read in the States uh, of people keeping these pets and they've had the pet for 10 years and suddenly it just rips their face off. Um, and they will they will cause incredible damage. Um, they're, they're very human-like in the way they behave. What about dingoes? It began in August 1980 when baby Azaria disappeared from an Ayers Rock campsite, never to be found. Her parents blamed a dingo. The police charged her parents, and Australia stood divided. Publicly, all over the world, we've been acclaimed as murderers and had that... Yes, that case. Um, I could never understand why people couldn't believe that it was a dingo that took that baby because in the years afterwards up on Fraser Island there, there are dingoes who are dragging toddlers off their, their mats. There are dingoes herding kids into the water like they do kangaroos. I mean, they're hunting dogs. And what do hunting dogs do? They, they hunt prey. And what's prey? A baby. So I, I just thought that was uh, an extraordinarily unfortunate and sad case. Was the sort of confounding factor, and we we're talking about the Azaria Chamberlain case, that they didn't find her body, so it was harder to say exactly what had happened? Well... <sighs> It was to become the most publicised case in Australian history. The baby was either attacked by a dingo, as alleged by the parents, or it was murdered. The sharp, rip, jagged marks in that very thickly woven blanket, we knew that that was a, was a powerful beast. After a second investigation and inquest, Lindy Chamberlain was charged and tried for murder. In 1986, the matinee jacket was found near a dingo lair at Uluru. The NT government ordered Mrs Chamberlain's immediate release. A year later, a royal commission cleared the couple of all guilt. I don't think just because you can't find something, you can jump to conclusions. Um, I understand there are all sorts of strange experiments that were done with you know, legs of lamb in, with uh, captive dingoes. What that has to do with um, uh, what actually happened out of that campsite, I don't know. Um, Probably fortunately I wasn't here and I wasn't involved um, because it really was not a, uh, a good moment for Australian forensics. How about some of the animals that we just assume are more gentle, like sheep or koalas or kangaroos or those animals that you imagine are less likely to um, murder you? Yeah, sheep actually, um, rams can get very vicious in the mating season and they will um, really cause injuries. And again, on uh, the internet, there are some incredible pictures from Europe of shepherds just being taken apart by these, these rams. Um, the main problem with sheep really is people hitting them when they're riding their uh, bikes, motorbikes in the outback and the same thing with kangaroos. Um, you think, well, what does it matter? Well, if you're aware that, you know, a roo or a sheep may be a problem. You can search the motorbike for tufts of fur and then you can at least give the family the story about this is what's happened. Um, it doesn't change anything, but at least it gives you an idea. We'll be right back after this. Our Australian animals have a pretty bad reputation from snakes to spiders to cassowaries to everything else. What do you think is the scariest or which is the one that you've seen inflict the most damage? Probably sharks. 
A man in his 20s has died after being attacked by a shark while surfing. A man has been killed in a shark attack while bodyboarding at a popular West Australian beach. A surfer has been attacked by a shark. A boy just 15 years old, dead after a shark attack. The number of fatalities makes it the deadliest year here since 1934. I did a review of uh, shark deaths in South Australia for over probably about 50 years, and um, they uh, they do tend to make a mess. Well, there's two sort of shark episodes where, where somebody was saying, I read the other day, that we shouldn't call them attacks. And I think what they're trying to say is that these are animals in the wild and we're in their area, so you know we should not give them such a hard time. But what they will sometimes do is they'll come up underneath somebody and they will spiral and pull a limb off uh, because they think it's a seal. Um, and then that's, that's the only injury you have. Other times they can get quite vicious and they can pull the body apart. Um, and you may find nothing at this scene. You may find a, uh, a piece of lung that's blown up on the uh, foreshore, which will have the typical triangular bite mark of the shark. Why is that? Well, because the sharks have dragged the bodies down. The lungs are full of air. They come to the surface and so they survive. One of the worst things for us with um, after a shark attack is that everybody who goes down to the beach brings every piece of rotting flesh from every fishing pot in and says, oh, I'm sure it's human. So we'll get, we'll get bags and bags of just sheep and squid and chickens. But you have to examine it? We have to go through, yes. yes. So that's not a pleasant side of it. So how do you work out if it's you know a, a guts from a cow or if it's something more sinister? Do you have to DNA type this or can you just tell by looking at it? Uh, we can usually tell by looking, um, but there are some tests you can do that uh, you know can tell you whether it's human tissue or not. It's, uh, it's a dipstick test, so it's it's pretty easy to do. Have you had to conduct um, any autopsies where sharks have been involved? I imagine that's pretty tricky. Yeah, I have. I've had a couple of uh, a couple of cases. Um, if the body is reasonably intact, then it's not. All that difficult. One of the things we do is we've worked out this technique of you've got this huge hole in the thigh, say, and you think, my God, that's a huge amount of tissues out. When you sew the layers back, often there's nothing gone. So it's not it's not been the shark hasn't been feeding. It's just been the shark going for this person and maybe just realizing that it's not a seal and spitting them out. I know how professional you are and how much deep sort of respect you have for the process, but that must be traumatic. As I've said, for me, I think we as pathologists deal with it because we know we're actually helping people. Uh, we're trying to work out what has happened. It's, it's, it's a scientific exercise. So that, that shields us, I think. Certainly at the end of the day when you're sitting back, you know, you're not happy. Um, but you feel at least you've been part of the process. You're speaking about sharks and obviously they are pretty scary for a lot of us and we've got crocs and all sorts of things in Australia. What other sort of injuries do you see associated with animals in the ocean? Crocodiles too. I, I reviewed cases from the Territory because I worked up, I did some flying doctor work up north and uh, they're, uh, they're nasty beasts. Armour plated um, and not very bright. Yeah, so uh, no, they can cause a lot of damage. Um, oh, there's so many different things. I mean, we had a case last year of a fellow who's just fishing in the Darwin Harbour and got hit with a mackerel. Um, it was jumping out of the water to get away from sharks and just flipped into him in the boat and this thing was, you know, more than 20 kilograms. In the calm waters of Darwin Harbour, a family's fishing trip went horribly wrong. Paramedics responded to a call for a male who was out fishing in the Darwin Harbour and he was struck uh, to the chest and torso by a large fish. Struck uh, with blunt force trauma to that left chest uh, and then uh, rapidly deteriorated. There are all sorts of weird things that can happen. One of the problems with animals too is, you know, did they actually cause a death or did they just come across the body afterwards? And that can be quite complicated. Um, for example, a body is found that's got shark bites. Well, did the shark just feed on the body after he drowned? Um, there are elderly recluses who live on their own who have animals and it's called Diogenes syndrome. It should be called Havisham syndrome really after Miss Havisham because they just, they don't, they don't get anywhere near anybody. They don't seek medical attention. They just live with their animals. And when they die, of course, nobody knows. And then finally, when they're found, um, often the animals are dead as well, but the animals have been feeding off them. And um, 
they make a terrible mess. So the police come in and the place, they're hoarders, so it looks as if it's been done over. Uh, there's blood and secretions all through the house where the animals have tracked it through, and they often have quite, the bodies have quite horrendous injuries where the animals have been eating. Um, so again, animals can confuse uh, investigations. So what's the process like to work out whether the animal attack has happened before or after death? It's sometimes difficult. Um, sometimes if the person survived for some time, you get a, a, it's called a vital reaction in the tissues that you can see. Sometimes you just don't know. Um, I remember one case years ago of an elderly person who lived alone and um, the, the photograph I, I had of the body on the autopsy table told the entire story. The person had a, uh, basically a twisted bowel, so the bowel had died and you can see this purple bowel. And then there are all of these injuries around the shoulder. And if you looked at them closely, you could see actually scratch marks and bite marks. So this old healer that lived with the person had actually been feeding on, on the body because he had nothing else left. Um, so it's quite, uh, it's quite sad really when you, uh, you, you come across a situation like that. If something's not related to a crime, why is it important to find out how somebody's died? Well, often you don't know that it's not a crime, particularly in, say, a Diogenes syndrome where it looks as if something's happened. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, to establish a cause of death, you have to have a treating doctor uh, or a medical history. And if you've got none of those, then you can't actually process the body through birth, deaths and marriages and everything in the coronial process until there's been an autopsy to work out. So uh, a lot of it is excluding crime um, and a lot of it is just... Um, coming up with an idea of what exactly has happened and who could have done this and what could have done this and, um, you know, is, is it okay? Do you ever find when you are investigating something that looks like it might be crime-related but an animal has sort of complicated that after death and it's harder to establish what's actually happened because, of, again, that post-mortem interference oh. of an animal? Animals, I mean, animals will feed on soft parts so they sometimes go for the genitalia so then it looks as if there's been this sort of sadistic murder that's occurred where it's not. Um, they'll go for moist areas. So if somebody's been shot or stabbed and the body's in a house and there's a dog and the dog's hungry or a cat, they'll eat that area. So they'll completely modify the wound. So I can't tell what sort of wound it was. They will eat tissues that got bullets in them. So sometimes you have to get the most junior policeman there to pick up all of the droppings and then x-ray them. Um, we'll x-ray the animal to see if there are bullets in there. So they, they can, yeah, muck up a scene tremendously. And is it usually dogs and cats, or do you see this happening with, with other kind of more, you know, less expected animals? Oh, rats, of course. Uh, rats and mice, they, they, they chew fingers. Um, um, they, they will modify wounds as well. I think I mentioned the uh, mouse before that actually took shreddings from a nose and plugged up a bullet hole, so I undercounted the bullet holes. How do you learn to expect or you know, identify what's going on in your training? How, is, how, how do you learn how to work out what's what? I think it happens when you're on the job. You just keep making so many mistakes that make you look stupid that, uh, you know, you eventually think, I've got to get this right. Um, but no, the, the reality is that I was trained by a very uh, lovely Mexican pathologist in Canada, and he used to come up with a diagnosis. And then he'd sit back and he'd say, now, why have I got this wrong? What else could it be? He had absolutely no ego in the process. Uh, it was it was a really, really lovely, logical way to approach something. And, uh, and that's what you've got to do. Um, talk to your colleagues. I mean, we see stuff every couple of weeks that none of us have seen before. And we just have to uh, research it and talk about it. And what could this be? Could this be due to that? Um, that's one of the reasons why forensics is so fascinating, because it's you're constantly problem solving. Guardians of the Dead is brought to you by The Advertiser, True Crime Australia and the University of Adelaide. The show is produced by myself, Greg Barilla. Elisa Black is your host. Mixing and sound design by Emily Dore. Make sure you're following Guardians of the Dead on your favourite podcast app. And if you enjoyed it, be sure to leave us a review. In the next episode, Roger explains the forensic aspects of the Snowtown investigation and the unique challenges these gruesome killings presented. He also recalls his prevailing memories of one of the world's most shocking acts of evil. I'm Greg Barilla. Thanks for listening.